Um, if you have a collection of ancient documents there that we call a Bible, uh, open up with me this morning. We're going to kind of continue on a little bit from last week. Uh, bounce off a few thoughts. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. Here's what it says. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. He says, I've betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's us, isn't it? We have been uh, betrothed to one husband, to Jesus. How many of you, when you, gave, you, when you came to faith, how many of you uh, uh, understood and realized that uh, coming to Jesus was not about adopting a certain amount of religious ritual that you would then bring into your life or some religious observance type stuff that you could bring in. Uh, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, there were enough religions. He didn't need to add another one. Amen? He didn't come with the intention of adding another one. In fact, that was part of the problem. Religion is about man's efforts to try to reach up to God. The story of Jesus is God's effort to reach down to man. It's God doing for us that which we couldn't do. Uh, it's grace. The gospel begins with grace. There's a big patch in the middle called grace, and it ends with this thing called grace. And isn't that a great thing? Amen? Who thinks they're good enough here in their own mef- efforts and their own merits? No, anybody, anybody holy enough? Who thinks they're holy enough? Hey? No? Jeez, I'm in the wrong church. What are we doing? Isn't that, what, isn't that what church is about? We should be making you more holy. Is that, you know? No, no, no. We, we preach Jesus. We talk about Jesus because if you get to know him, here's the thing. If you focus on building a relationship with Jesus, the rest of the stuff kind of falls into place, doesn't it? If you try to focus on the rest of the stuff without putting Jesus in his right place, then you just end up a very religious person. And uh, God's not impressed with religiosity or religious people. Uh, God wants us to come back into relationship. Jesus died on a cross to get rid of that which stopped me having relationship. Uh, he didn't need to die if there wasn't something standing between me and him. He could have just come down and taught us all the religious stuff. This is what you should do. I'm going to teach you how to pray properly, how to fast properly, uh, how to go to church properly. I'm going to teach you how to love people properly. I'm going to teach you what you should give. And how my, like He could have just gone and given us all that. Or God could have saved himself the trouble instead of sending a person in the form of Jesus, maybe he could have just thrown down a big book, you know, a big rule book, tossed it down from the heavens and somebody could have found it and uh, we could have just all lived in relationship with a book. But we're called to have a relationship with a very real and a very living God. So he says, I'm jealous for you. With a godly jealousy, I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then watch this, but he says, but I fear, lest somehow, somehow, As the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love that phrase. Simplicity that is in Christ. The NIV version puts it this way. It says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds have somehow been led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Here's the thing. Eve didn't do what she did. And I'm going to jump Adam in that too, so nobody thinks I'm being sexist, all right? Adam and Eve did not do what they did, eat that fruit, turn away from God, right? Adam and Eve did not do that because they were evil. Think about that. There was no such thing as a sin nature. It was a perfect world, was it not? It's, it's Adam and Eve, sinless and perfect, living in an uncorrupted world. There's no corruption in the environment. There's no corruption in nature. There's no corruption in the space they're in. Walking in daily fellowship with God, perfect relationship with God, purely devoted to God, God having this beautiful, intimate relationship with Him. And in the midst of this perfect world, they were led astray. In the midst of a perfect world, the most perfect environment you can think of, the kind of environment that we all think, if I was there, I wouldn't have done that. Who's ever thought that? Who's ever ever cursed Adam and Eve and thought, you stupid humans? How could you have done something so dumb? If I was there, I would never have done that. Anyone ever done like that? I have. I used to think that. And then one day it dawned on me, well, these guys were way more perfect than me. They don't have any of the baggage I had. But they didn't even have baggage at this point. They hadn't been disappointed. They hadn't been hurt. They hadn't been rejected. They hadn't been persecuted. They hadn't had anybody say, oh, you're a Jesus freak. They hadn't, nothing like that had happened to them. They're perfect and sinless. It's the most amazing environment with the most amazing God and the most whole people you're ever going to find. And yet they were deceived in that. 
They didn't do what they did because they were evil. They did what they did because they were deceived by the devil. And the devil's very, very good at what he does. Amen? He's very good at what he does. I don't fear him, but I'm aware of him. He's like a, 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 roar, a roaming lion seeking who he can devour. And, and, and the devil was there, and the devil in this perfect environment deceived them and took them down a path that separated them from God, separated them from where they started. The goal of the deception was to steal you away from sincere devotion to Christ. And how did he do that? Well, by distracting their mind away from the centrality and simplicity of a relationship with God. He says that he deceived them in their minds. He took their minds away from just a simple, pure trust and devotion to God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you actually believe that you've got no time to invest into spiritual disciplines anymore? I loved your communion talk and what you were talking about this morning. Lockie, it was awesome. How many of you believe that you've got no time for prayer? Just got no time for it anymore. We've got no time for the Word of God anymore. That you don't have time to commit to or invest in Christian community or building spiritual relationships with other people. How many of us feel like the practices of the early church are outdated now because society is much more advanced than it used to be? That the real needs of people are different now than they were in the first century? How many of us think that the gospel story doesn't actually meet the needs of people like it did in the first few centuries anymore? How many of us think that it's impossible to think that the church today could in any way resemble the church of back then. It's impossible. We've come too far. And maybe some people think it's a step too far to believe that God might want to reveal himself in the same powerful and glorious ways today as he actually did 2,000 years ago. He may just want to do that. But, but I wonder, in our minds, have we kind of strayed away from some of those simple thoughts? The simplicity of pure devotion to Christ and trust in God. Now, usually the devil's deceptions are a series of small thoughts that over time they lead us away from the destination that we're supposed to be heading to. Notice this he didn't tell Eve, take this fruit and it'll pull you away from God. Now, had he said that and she took it, I really would have thought that was stupid. But he didn't say that, did he? He actually made it sound pretty palatable and, and pretty good. He actually said, no, if you eat this, you'll become more like God. Isn't that a great thing? Who doesn't want to be more like God? I mean, isn't that the New Testament thing? We want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Isn't that becoming more like God? So when, when I think about it that way, I go, okay, they, they, they were basically uh, deceived uh, by being fed a lie that today we kind of, no, we want to be like God. We want to be more like Jesus, but that's not what it meant there. We don't want to be more like God by disobeying God. You'll never become more like God by disobeying God. You never become more like Jesus or conformed more into the image of Jesus by living a life disobedient to Jesus. It's not going to happen. And so it's a series of small lies. It's usually not one big thought or one big event that derails us either from our spiritual life. It's a series of small, believable, perhaps logical ones that can nudge us off the path that God originally put us on. The path that God originally put us on. In 1983, there was a, a Korean airliner, airline 007. No, it was not James Bond. It was an airline. And it took off from New York City, headed to Anchorage, Alaska, and then from there it was flying on to Seoul, Korea. And when the plane took off from Anchorage, there was an error of one degree in the flight plan. One degree in the flight plan. When the plane took off from Anchorage, there was a one degree error in the flight plan, and that one degree difference had a huge impact on that flight. And there were 269 people on board that plane as well. That one degree off took it straight across U, uh, Soviet airspace, Russian airspace. And so the Russians sent some fighter jets up there and they shot down this plane. This happened in 1983. They shot the plane down and all 269 people on board lost their life. It was a tragic day. It was a tragic mistake and a tragic outcome, all because of one degree. One degree meant the difference between life and death for all those people on that plane. Last week, we began to look at the story of Isaac, and we looked at the redigging of his father Abraham's wells. And I asked you to think about your own journey, your own walk with God, where, where you were, and where you feel like you are now. And I wonder if you're on the same course in regards to your allegiance to Jesus that you were when you started. Or, whether just like the plain in the above story, you found yourself heading off course, and maybe heading into dangerous territory. You know that you don't have that commitment to faith anymore, as much as you used to. You know your passion for Jesus is 
probably third or fourth, maybe fifth on the list. You know that your walk with God is kind of like God's way over there and I'll kind of bring him in if I need to, but, you know, I've been doing this Christian thing long enough now, I kind of don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. I can, I've worked it out, you know. I know how to do it. Just like the flight, we only need one degree off course, which is hardly noticeable, by the way, when you begin to take off. But over time, you find yourself in a place that you never intended to go to, you never intended to be. C.S. Lewis put it this way. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, isn't it funny how day by day nothing changes, but when you look back, everything's different. Think about your own life. Isn't that true? It's funny how day by day nothing changes. It just, it just feels like every day we go through the motions and we do what we do, and we don't notice every day the changes, whether they be good or bad changes. We don't notice the, the course, the direction, the long-term place that we're heading because they're incremental and they're tiny and they're just little things. And day by day it feels like nothing's changing, but then five years or, or ten years down the track you look back and you go, how did I end up in this place? How did I actually get here? Because when I started off, I had no intention of being here. But I did. How did I get here? Well, it probably wasn't some big event or some big thought or some big deception. It was probably just subtle little one degree changes that in the long run take us to a destination that we never intended to go to. It's true that we rarely notice the positive difference good disciplines and habits have in our lives in the moment. But over time you look back and you can see the evidence. In the same way we rarely notice the negative differences that poor disciplines and bad habits have in our lives. But again, over time you look back and you see the evidence of some of that stuff. Here's a question for you. When you think about your own spiritual journey and you look back, I'm going to steal a line from Aldi here, so please forgive me. When you think about your own spiritual journey and you look back, is it good different? Or is it bad different? Is it good different? Or would you sum it up as maybe it's, if I'm brutally honest, in the quiet moments when no one's around and the worship's not playing, and I'm not reading it, when I'm sitting there by myself, maybe I can admit to myself it's different, but it's probably bad different. It's probably bad different. I don't think I'm going from faith to faith or glory to glory. I don't think I'm getting closer to the Lord. I don't think I'm getting more passionate for Him. I don't think I'm running more after the things of God. I, I think I'm caring less about the plans and purposes of God for my life than I did back then. Now I'm just settling into whatever, and I'm happy with whatever. Because one day... I'll go to heaven and I'll see him anyway. So does it really make a difference? It feels like nothing's changing because it's only one degree, a few millimetres a day. But over time, you begin to see the impact. Day by day, we don't seem to notice the compounding interest on the habits and disciplines of life, whether they be good or bad. And the truth is that sometimes a more prosperous future is found by reclaiming some things from our past, by redigging old worlds we used to drink from, by going back to ground zero, heading back to that place where we first took off on the plane journey. Amen. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about uh, for these next few weeks. Remember last week I said this, redigging the wells is not about finding something new, it's about reclaiming something that's lost. It's about finding our way back to some of the sources of life and prosperity that we knew in the past and that can still contribute to our future. So over the next few weeks we're going to look at a number of wells that the early church drank from. Now here's, here's my prayer, we're going to look specifically at the early church. This collection of believers that, that gave their life to Jesus, Jesus uh, crucified, died on a cross. Most of them ran away. Most of them ran away. Christ was then resurrected. They saw him. Some of them still did not believe it was him. They had to see. Then he, then he sends them and he says, go and wait in Jerusalem. You're going to receive power. Then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we know that this small band of people, 120 from that point on, went and turned the world upside down. In fact, if it wasn't for what that 120 people did, you would not be sitting in this room today. That's the reality. You would not be here. You can go right back and read the words of the early church, see the messages they preached, the places they went, and you know that your spiritual lineage is connected directly to some of that stuff because if they didn't do what they did, we wouldn't be here today. Amen? We wouldn't be here today. If they gave in to the pressure and the persecution, if they didn't have certain disciplines and things in their world, in their lives, corporately as a church, but individually as believers as well, if they didn't have some of that stuff in their world, I reckon they probably would have caved and they probably would have fallen over and maybe we wouldn't have this worldwide movement we have right now. Because I don't know if God had a plan B. It doesn't tell us in the Word of God whether he had a plan B. And I wonder whether the angels in heaven were looking at Jesus when he ascended and they're all excited, going, okay, now what's the next step of world domination? And he points down to those guys. And they breathed a collective sigh and went, 
you've got to be kidding. <laughs> Those guys? But something happened with them. And because of that, we're here today. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at what were some of the wells that the early church, the book of Acts, it's the first 30 years of church history. What were some of the wells that the early church drank from? Now, in doing that, in doing that, when we say church, we mean each of us as individuals. And I want the Holy Spirit to challenge you. I want you to think about each of these things. Because probably at some point in your journey, I'll guarantee these things were part of your early source of life as well. And maybe you as an individual have drifted away from some of these things. So, so, so when I say church, I'm talking about you. And when we look at these different worlds, I want you to think personally, was that a part of my early journey? And I'll be pretty confident that most of these things were. And ask yourself the question, have I drifted from them? Do I need to go back and redig some of those wells because they were a source of life and prosperity to me at one point and the wells haven't run dry? So what were some of the wells dug by the early church back in the beginning? I'm just going to talk about two of them this morning. The first one is this, the well of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. The well of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. We have been talking about the Holy Spirit now for about three to four months and I feel like there's a reason for that. I feel like it's... I, 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 I was laying in bed the other night, right? And Jackie will attest to this because I have no doubt she heard it. You ever have, I don't know what I ate. I don't know what happened. I don't know what went into my body. But my stomach was making all kinds of like, it was like there was a Cirque du Soleil going on inside there. You know, trapezes and backflips and side things and dancing and so on. And it wouldn't stop. I couldn't stop it. I mean, this, I reckon it went on for about six hours. At one point I said, Lord, if that's you, speak to me. You know, it's... I felt like little Samuel. Yes, God. Oh, hang on, it's your own stomach. Gurgling and grinding. And there was something going on in there and it was out of my control and it was just burgling around and, and rumbling and so on. And I don't know about you, I feel like there's a rumbling of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the church. I'm not just saying here. I'm saying I, I feel like there's this rumbling of the Holy Spirit at the moment in the church in general. And, and, and I feel like part of that rumbling is a call back to some of the simplicity of faith in Jesus. It's a call back to some of those early passions. It's a call back to some of the wells that the early church drank from that we know we drank from as well. But somewhere along the line, we got a bit more sophisticated. Or we got a bit smarter, maybe. Or maybe we, maybe we, we you know, I understand what Paul meant when he wrote this better than Paul does. You ever feel that way? Like people feel like we, 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 we've, we've got such great understanding of Greek and Hebrew these days that I understand what these guys wrote even more than they do. So I'm going to reinterpret it. So it's, no, 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 no. I'm not that smart. I'm not that smart. But I feel like there's this gentle calling of God saying, you know what, if you would just come back to me, if, if you would just come back to trusting the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that kick-started this whole movement. It wasn't their brilliance. It wasn't their skills, their charisma, their intelligence, their biblical nous. It was the Holy Spirit in them, moving through them. Jesus said that, I'll, I'll pour that water. He said that water will then flow out of your belly. Like living water, it'll come out of you. It'll pour it into you. It'll come out of you. And as you allow me, my spirit, to come out and move through you, he said, I'm going to do some pretty amazing things. And he built this thing called the church by doing that. But then we get to a point where we go, no, no, no. If we just had better lights, if we just get a better bunch of worship leaders, if we get bigger buildings, if we get a smoke machine, if we just get better preachers, if we get guys that can hold an audience like Tony Robbins, if we, can just, if we can just add all these things, and maybe in our own journey with God as well, we think, well, God, if you would just answer that prayer, then I could fly on with you. If you would just move this obstacle, if you would just this, and God's there going, you can fly on with me where you are right now because you have the Spirit with you. You don't need anything else. It's great to have some other things, but I don't need it. I've got God. The one that when Jesus' lifeless body was laying in that tomb, it says that the Holy Spirit went in there and I don't know what he did, touched him on the big toe and power pulsed through him and he got up It says the one, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, think about this, dwells in your mortal flesh. Think about that. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. This is not hype. This is not trying to G people up. This is what these writers said. This is what the early church believed. And on the basis of believing that, they went out and did some pretty amazing things. They were bold. They were confident. They weren't going to be shut up by persecution. Culture couldn't stop the message or the, or the actions that flowed out of their relationship with him. They took the world by storm. They took the world by storm. They didn't have uh, electricity. They didn't have a great worship band, a smoke machine. 
Paul says in Corinthians, he says, when I came to you guys, he said, I actually came in weakness and fear and much trembling. I came in weakness and fear and I was afraid. But I did it anyway. Because I had a boldness and a confidence because I knew who was with me. And so what I did, what I did. You know, I believe in the word of God. If you don't have a Bible, get one. Seriously. I mean, that sounds like a dumb thing at church, doesn't it? It's like saying to the kids that rock up, when I used to coach rugby league, they'd rock up in the morning and we'd be getting ready to go out in the field and I'd say to them, get your boots on. But you know what was amazing? There'd always be one or two that went, oh, I forgot my boots. We drove all the way to casino with your mum and dad and you didn't bring your boots. You're kidding, aren't you? You need your boots to play. So I'm all for the word of God. I love the word of God. Get the word of God. I read the word of God every day. I devour the word of God. And hopefully everything I preach comes out of the word of God. If it doesn't, then shut me down and cancel me. Because I've got nothing to say other than what the word of God says. But here's the reality. The early church, they did what they did without a Bible. They didn't have a a leather-bound copy of these New Testament documents like we do. They didn't have that. But they must have had something. Because they went out and they preached and they healed and they delivered and they set captives free. And they defied governments when governments said you can't do what God tells you to do. And they did it all without a Bible. But they had the Holy Spirit. They had the very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead on the inside of them. Please hear me. Don't anyone walk out of here and say, Alan's not into the word of God. I am. These are the train tracks. And I don't go outside the boundaries of what God has told me about himself and his operations within the the, the railway tracks of the word of God. I'm 100% into the word of God. But my point is this. The early church didn't have that. But they had something. And what they had was the very presence of the Holy Spirit. The same as you and I do, but I wonder whether we believe it as much as they did. I wonder whether we're aware of it, whether we fix our mind on that truth as much as they did. I don't know. Just a question. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have Jesus either, by the way. He was seated at the right hand of the Father by this stage. He'd been crucified, appeared with him and chatted with him for about 40 days, and then off he went. But he sent his Holy Spirit. The first New Testament author didn't write until about AD 45, roughly. And the Bible, as we know, it wasn't officially compiled together until around AD 400. But they had the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Think about that. They had the Holy Spirit. How many of you, how many of you hold back a little bit in conversation or you hold back a little bit because you, 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 you kind of think, I've just got to know a bit more about, about, I've just got to, if I can just learn a bit more about the Word of God, then now I'm encouraging you to do that. You should study the Word of God. Do a Bible course. I'm all for that. But can you hear what I'm saying? You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. And you may not have the greatest uh, amount of biblical literacy to you, but you have the Holy Spirit. Amen? You, you, You may not be the most eloquent speaker, but you have the Holy Spirit. You might not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but you have the Holy Spirit. The one that Jesus said, he's going to reveal things to you. He said, he's going to show you truth. He said, he's going he's to speak through you. Don't worry, about, don't worry about it when you get in those difficult situations. When you get taken before kings and courts and governments, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll give it to you in the moment. This is the Holy Spirit. Peter and John walking to the, to the, to the temple in Acts chapter 4, I think it is. Silver and gold we don't have. We don't have any money. But what we have we give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And they grab him and pull him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't do that. They can't heal anybody. They're just people like you and me. But they knew who was with them. They knew and they believed in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit empowered the early church. The Spirit witnessed through the early church. The Holy Spirit led the early church. The Holy Spirit appointed them and called them to ministry. Acts chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them to. The Holy Spirit did that. They appointed leadership in Acts chapter 20. Paul, I think it's the Ephesian leaders. He says, he says, make sure that you look after the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Look after them. Look after them. The Holy Spirit is central to the life and activity of the early church. And, I, and the question, I guess, is, is the Holy Spirit central to the life and activity of us as believers today? Is he central to your world? Do you wake up with an awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit with you? Or is the Holy Spirit just a theory? Is the Spirit just something over here that, that you know, put in the too hard basket? Because it really doesn't matter that much. Well, according to Jesus, the main thing that mattered when he left was the presence of the Spirit. He said, don't you do anything until you receive 
power from on high. Don't you go and do anything. You wait. There's just something about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through simple, normal human beings like you and me that glorifies God and makes a difference. And God can do in a moment what we can bang our heads against the brick wall for a year trying to make happen. You know, one of the most recorded comments made by God directed to his people in this collection of ancient documents is what? What's the most recorded comment? What's the most recorded comment in this collection of ancient documents that God said to his people? Come on, it's not a hard one, I bet you know it. Eh? Yep, no, stand up, turn around, tell everybody. Come on, be bold, be confident. Do not be afraid. That's right, do not fear. It's the most recorded, if you, if, you, if you broke down everything that God said to his people in the, these ancient documents, the most common thing that God said to his people was that phrase, do not fear, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. But, it, but it's not like God says, don't be afraid, and then leaves you at that. And then you've got to figure out, well, okay, well, how do I not be afraid? Now I've got to work it out, okay, so don't be afraid. So, okay, what have I got to put in my life? What things do I have to work out? What do I need to know? Like, what's got to happen so that I can live a life where I'm not afraid? He doesn't do that. He says, do not fear. And you know what's 99% of the time, you know, it's connected to it? Do not fear because I am with you. I am with you. Think about that. Do not fear. And the reason why you don't have to fear is because I'm with you. He could have put it the other way around. I'm with you, so don't fear. I'm with you, so don't fear. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about what mere mortals might be able to do or are capable of doing. He said, I'm with you. Don't fear. I'm for you, not against you. I love you. I've got plans and purposes for you, and I'm walking with you, and I'm in you. And there's nothing you're confronted with or facing that I'm not aware of in the moment with you. Right there. Right there. Jackie often, I used to travel a bit, and Jackie would often comment when I would come home that she would sleep better at night. And, she, and, and it wasn't that, I mean, look at me, I'm not like, you know, someone breaks in the house, I'm praying, trust me. That's my first port of call is prayer. Okay, God, you've got to help me. But, but even having this, even having a stick figure in the house, my wife would say, you know what, I just sleep so much better because it's just about knowing that there, that presence was there. Man, if, if, if she can feel that way, if, if the presence of someone that she doesn't really need, because she doesn't need me, if the presence of someone she doesn't really need, who's limited in wisdom, insight and power, can help dissipate any potential fear that might want to creep in, how much so a full revelation of God with you? Of God with you. How much? If we live with that understanding and that knowledge. If you're comfortable, I want you to do me a favour for a second. I want everyone in this room, I want you to close your eyes just for a second. I want you to repeat this to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud, but I just want you to say this. Speak to yourself this morning. Just say this. Thank you, God, that you're with me right now. Right here. In this place. In this moment. Thank you that you love me. And that you see me. Right now. Right here in this very moment. Now and always. Always. I, I, thank, I thank you right now, Holy Spirit. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. See, it's not about me feeling great or awesome or wonderful about myself, really. I hope I do, and I want to. But it's about knowing that a great, awesome and wonderful God is with me despite how I feel about myself in the moment. He's with you. Don't lose sight of that. Tap into that every morning when you wake up, every morning, every morning. Remind yourself. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Speak the word of God out into your own ears. The word of God says that you're with me today. You'll never leave me nor forsake me. So I'm speaking that out, not just some magical spell into the cosmos. I'm speaking it so I can hear it, so I can build faith in that. 
till I get to the point where I, I just, it doesn't matter what I face, where I go, what circumstance I'm in, I'm drinking from that well of the Holy Spirit's presence and power, just like the early church did. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great to never second guess the presence of God anymore? No matter how you felt, no matter whether the prayer was answered or not, wouldn't it be great to never second guess again the presence of God? To not live one of those, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves them, that kind of, he's with me, he's not with me, he's with me, he's not with me, he's with me, he's not with me. God is with you. And the first well we need to go back to is the well of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. And the second one, second well that I want to talk about this morning is the well of the prayer of faith. Now, I didn't say the well of prayer. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying a well of prayer. I'm saying a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith. People all over the world pray today. And they do it for many and varied reasons. And there are known benefits to prayer. There are a lot of therapeutic benefits to prayer. I was, I was reading this week about some of the, the health benefits. Psychologists and psychiatrists and, and, and doctors are now in America and Europe are starting to incorporate prayer into their practices. Not prayer, not prayer like the New Testament prayer, but prayer to some supreme being that just might happen to be there, maybe. But it makes you feel good to think that there could be something there. There's no real faith about it. It's just, it's, it's, they, 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 you know, serotonin levels are released and increased in your brain when you pray. They've done studies on this kind of stuff. Your brain cells, anyone feel like they've lost any brain cells? Yep, yep. Well, you know what? You know what? They've studied and proven through research that the stuff that re, rebuilds brain cells happens, it gets released in your body when you pray and meditate. There, there are physical benefits of prayer. Stress levels have been released. There's all kinds of things about prayer. Well, I read an article in Psychology Today. This came out in September uh, 30, 2019, and here's what they said. They said, research consistently shows that prayer can have numerous benefits. For example, prayer can be a solid source of self-soothing and self-comfort when one is experiencing pain, coping with loss, or dealing with traumatic circumstances. Prayer can also be of benefit as a form of concentrated mental emotion, mental motivation for achieving personal goals. Prayer can also help people focus on the well-being of others. And of course, when one finds oneself in a hopeless and helpless situation with no real options, no clear solution, and no actionable form of alleviation, then prayer is something to engage into, at the very least, to make one feel like one is doing at least something in the face of dire circumstances. This is what they're saying. Clearly, people pray because it makes them feel better. This is the article still. People pray because it makes them feel better. It makes them feel hope or makes them feel love, or makes them feel just a welcomed hair shy of being utterly powerless. So concerning all of the above, it can be said that prayer works. But here's where they landed. But when it comes to prayer as a form of asking for something from a divine source and then getting it, there is simply no empirical evidence that such mental messaging to an invisible deity works. All stories of answered prayers are merely anecdotal and nothing more. They obviously haven't read the book of Acts. They obviously haven't sat down and talked to somebody that has a real relationship with Jesus and, 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 and got their stories from that. So the early church prayed, but they prayed with an attitude and a posture called faith. The early church prayed in faith. They didn't pray in, as a therapeutic form, as we read about there, in, some, in the hope of some personal therapeutic fulfillment that makes me feel good, makes me feel better, because there might be, maybe, could be, whatever. They prayed knowing that there was a God in heaven, knowing that the God listened. When they opened their mouth, they knew who was listening to the words, and they knew that he would be on point with it. They knew that God took their prayers serious, and that God, in those moments, went and started to release answers. It might not always be the answer you want, but it doesn't matter. They knew that God was on the job when they prayed. Prayer was not a therapeutic thing. It was real for them, regardless of how they felt. When was the last time that you were passionate about something enough that you prayed and prayed and prayed until you got an answer? When was the last time you, you had that kind of passion in prayer that you prayed and prayed and prayed until you got an answer, even if the answer was not the answer you wanted, but you got an answer? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 9, Paul he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation. In other words, God has given me so much stuff, dude. I've got so much revelation, it's pouring out of my pores. And I could become something really special here. Right? He goes, I've got all this revelation. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted above measure. I don't want to get into the theology of what it was and who and all that stuff. That's another time. But concerning this thing, listen to what he did. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, 
Who said to him? God. So he pleaded three times with God, take away this ugly situation. And then God spoke to him and gave him an answer. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest on me. The point is this. He went to God. He didn't get an answer. He didn't change. He went a second time. He didn't get an answer. He didn't change. He went a third time and he got an answer, even though the answer wasn't what he wanted. But he just kept going back to God. Why? Because he prayed in faith. He knew that God was listening. He knew God was there. He knew God cared. He knew God had a perspective. And he knew that God wanted to communicate because every loving father wants to talk to his children. Every loving father wants to do what they can to help their children. But loving fathers and loving mothers, we have a perspective about our children's desires and wishes and requests at times too. And sometimes we know things they don't, and sometimes we don't give them what they want because we know things they don't and because we love them. But the point is this, we answer anyway. And and Paul said here, I just kept on going back, and he answered. When was the last time you kept going back and back and back till you got an answer, even if it wasn't the answer you wanted, because that's faith. I I believe that God answers prayer. Who believes that God answers prayer? God answers prayer. God speaks to us. God responds to us. How does he do it? Any, many, and varied ways that he wants to. But the point is, we don't know how how this happened, but Paul just came to the conclusion, I want this thing gone, but I'm at peace now, because God's answered my prayer. He got involved in that. Paul pleaded with God till he got an answer. It wasn't what he wanted, but he got it. Now, Jesus asked the Father three times too, if this, if this cup can be taken away from me, wouldn't that be great? If we can do this another way, if I do not have to go through the pain and the humiliation of the cross, if you can somehow reconcile this bunch of, 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 of people back to you without me going through what I could go through, then Father, I sure would appreciate that and I would jump at that option. And he went back a second time and he prayed again. And he prayed a third time. Always with, but your will be done at the end of the day. How many of us pray? And then we get up and we move on with life as if nothing's happened. How many people pray as if it means nothing? We would never say that. We would say, I've just prayed. But is it therapeutic? Is it just, I feel good because I prayed? Or do you get up and move on expecting, looking and listening and wanting an answer from God and trusting that your heavenly Father is going to bring something past? He's going to, he wants to speak to you. He wants to answer you. Or do we just get up and go, well, that was therapeutic for me. It just felt good to pray. I put my 20 minutes aside and prayed this morning. I'll tick that religious box. I've done a great job here today and I'll move on with life. Meanwhile, your Father's trying to answer you, but you're not even looking or listening. We're just speeding on with life, doing our own thing. We get up and we move on as if nothing's happened. How many feel that prayer is just a religious duty that makes us feel good about ourselves after we've done it, as opposed to it being something that, when done in faith, has the power to shake the heavens and move the earth? Has the power to shake the heavens and move the earth? Is prayer simply about telling God what you want or need? Or did the early church see something more to prayer than just telling God what we wanted? Uh, Many years ago, a guy gave me a book, and uh, I've got it at home. And it was actually a book, the very first uh, landing that the engineers and everybody got together, and they sent the first man to the moon for NASA. And they wrote this manual, this little book thing. I don't know how this guy got a hold of it, but he got a hold of it and he gave it to me and he said, "Um, I'm going to come back and get it off to you because you can't get that book anywhere. Anyway, he disappeared out of my life and never got it. So I've still got this book at home. And and part of the story of that first time they went up there, they came up with this plan and they started with, okay, the the starting point is we've got to put a man on the moon. So they came up with a plan, did all the engineering and the astrophysics and all that stuff and came up with all that. And then they got this specialist guy in a room. When they'd finished their plan, they laid their plan out to him. And the guy said to them, well, you failed. They said, what do you mean we failed? He said, you failed. They said, no, hang on a second. We're going to get a man on the moon. And we've got the astronauts are trained and we picked the right people and we've got the right pressure in the cabins and we've got all the right material to make the shuttle thing. We've worked out when they get there and we've done the rotations of the sun and the moon. We've done it all. We've worked it out. He said, yeah, but you failed. They said, how have we failed? He said, because you shouldn't be planning on how to get a man on the moon. You should be planning on how to get a man back from the moon. (laughs) What's the good if you can get a man on the moon? Isn't that wonderful? Great. Let's just leave him up there. Well, that's not going to help, is it? That's not great. They said, he said, you failed because you've only planned half of it. You're just thinking of sending something up there to the moon. You've got to get this guy back. And when I, every time I think about that story, I think, you know, that, that, that to me is a great picture of prayer. And many of us see prayer as just this one-way thing. We're just going to commit our requests and all this stuff to God and throw it out there. But then we get up as if that's the end of prayer. I don't think the early church saw that as, as the end of prayer. 
I think that was the beginning of prayer because prayer was not a monologue to God. It's a dialogue back and forth. It's being open to God answering and bringing those answers into our lives. So prayer is not just about talking to God. It's also about listening and looking for God's response. How many of you, when you pray, actually then get up off your knees and go through the rest of your day, your week, your month with your antenna up going, God, here's how much I trust you. I presented this to you. Now, I know, God, in simple faith, because you're my father and you love me, I know that you see what's coming out of my heart. You understand this. It's not about the words, but you know. And so, God, I'm going to get up off my knees and I'm going to walk out there with my ears and my eyes open and I'm looking for and listening for your answer. What are you saying? When are you going to answer me, God? How are you going to show me the answer? Are you going to say something? Is someone going to say something over coffee? Is the preacher going to say something Sunday? Is there going to be a word in a worship song? Is someone going to ring me up during the week and just go, I just felt like God, you know? Or or is somebody just going to walk up to me randomly and have a conversation and they don't even know it's God, but I just know because I'm aware, I'm looking and I'm listening because prayer is not just me sending a rocket to the moon. You're going to send something back to me, God. You're going to send something back to me. Is that what your prayer is like? How many answers to prayer have we missed because we only do half the job? We forget to get up off our knees and look for the answers. The early church were a bunch of people that didn't just pray. They prayed in faith. They prayed in faith. But if you're not praying in faith, then you're not going to be expecting an answer, are you? You won't be actively participating in the other half of prayer. You will not be looking and you won't be listening. One of my favorite stories of prayer in the Bible, and I'll finish up with this, Acts chapter 12. It's one of the greatest stories in the New Testament about the power of prayer, but also one of the greatest examples of a bunch of religious people praying just for therapeutic reasons, maybe. Acts chapter 12. And verse 5, it says, Peter was kept in prison. So Peter had gotten in trouble off the authorities and they'd put him in prison. They'd bound him up with chains, all sorts of stuff, which tended to happen to these guys. They just sort of seemed to go on with their Jesus stuff and let culture do what culture wanted to do to them. They just said, well, we'll do the Jesus stuff and we'll let the chips fall where they do. Amen? Isn't that the chips fall where they do? But we're not backing down from the truth and the reality of Jesus anymore. We're not going to do that. So Peter was in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. What are the church praying for? Praying for him. Where is he? In prison. What do you think they might be praying for? Hey, get him out of prison, Lord. Get him out. Get this dude out. This guy loves you, Lord. He's passionate about you. He's in there because he might have disobeyed the authorities, but he obeyed you, God, and you're a higher authority than those authorities. So, Lord, we're praying for this guy's release. And so they gather together and they're praying. Fast forward to verse 12 through to 16, and here's what happens. So when, uh, when he had considered this, so Peter, we all know the story. An angel comes and the fetters fall off his hands and the prison door opens, and Peter thinks he's dreaming the whole time. He gets up and goes, okay, I don't know. I've never been in a dream and thought, oh, no, I'm dreaming, but I'm going to get up and participate in my own dream. When I dream, I thought it was real. For some reason, he thought he was in a dream, but he went, oh, go along with it anyway. It's just a dream. So he gets up and the chains fall off and he walks past the guards. And I don't know if he took a selfie with the guards. I'm not sure. Back then, they were asleep. I'll never believe this. I'll put it up on Facebook or whatever. And then he walks out and the door's open. He gets out in the street. And then all of a sudden, he goes, well, hang on. That just actually happened. That just actually happened. I'm free. And so he takes off to this house. And what's happening in this house? They're praying. What are they praying for? His release. He's in prison. They're praying for Peter. Lord, Peter, he loves you. He's a great guy. The authorities are telling him, but God, you, we, we're praying. Let this guy out. He's got more preaching to do, more things to get him out. So they're praying for his release. And in verse 12, it says, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. What a great girl of faith. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't even open the gate. Knock, knock, knock. Who is it? It's Peter. Ah! And Peter's just left hanging. Hello? Hello? He's standing there knocking on the door. Rhoda runs off. She recognized his voice because of the gladness. She didn't open the gate. But she ran in and told everybody uh, while Peter's standing there. She said, "Um, hey, Peter's outside. Peter's here. Peter's at the door. This little girl, Rhoda, in this prayer room with all these mature adults probably, praying with all these theological giants who get their V's right and their vows right and never mess up their words of prayer and they've got it all. And they're praying. And she hears the knock and she goes. And she hears his voice and she goes, that's all I need. That's all I need. She runs in and she tells all these seasoned older people, Peter's at the gate. In verse 15, but they said to her, you're beside yourself. That can't be Peter. We're praying for him to be released from prison. 
He's in prison. That can't be Peter. Really? Really? You're beside yourself. But she kept insisting it was so. So then they said, well, it must be his angel. I mean, God forbid that he answered our prayer, eh? Like, God forbid that that's actually Peter and everything we just prayed for has happened. That, that wouldn't be like God, would it? Of course not. So what do they do? God answers the prayer, and like most of us, they rationalize it, don't they? You know? First of all, no, it's not him. And then, okay, maybe it's his angel. And how many times has God answered prayer to you? And because you're not looking for the answer, you don't, not, you don't have faith out there waiting for that ship to come back with an answer. You're not looking for an answer. So God does answer, and we make up, oh, it's chance. What a coincidence that was. Oh, gee, that was lucky, wasn't it? Oh, that was... We do the same thing, don't we? We do the same thing. But God wants us to pray in faith. God wants us praying in faith, and that's about letting our requests be made known to God, but then getting up and looking for the answers. Looking for the answers. Do you pray like that? Is that your prayer life? Or has prayer just become this kind of religious ritual that you go through now? Do do you present your request to God and then do you get up from that space and walk away in faith and say, God, thank you. You I know you're with me and I know you heard me. And because you're my father and you love me and I know you heard me, I know that that you're sending an answer. Now, it might not be the answer I want, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to listen and look for the answer because I know you'll answer me because that's the power of prayer. That's the kind of prayer that the early church prayed. That's how the early church operated. And some of us need to go back And drink from the well of the prayer of faith. Some of us need to start looking at our prayer life again. Now here's the thing about prayer. My prayer itself is not the powerful thing. It's the person I'm praying to that has the power. Hey, people say, oh, I don't know how to pray. Do you know how to talk? But you know how to pray. Talk. (laughs) Do you know how to, to go to a restaurant and ask for a meal? And then go back to your normal conversation. In other words, go back to the rest of your life but sit there and know that the waiter will eventually come and he'll bring me the meal because that's what they do. I've, I've asked for a meal and they took my order and said so the waiter will bring me my meal. I'm not going to sit there stressing the whole time about the meal, but I'm, I'm, but, but, but I'm, I'm going to go back and live my life and talk and that. But you know what? The minute the waiter comes through the kitchen and I see that bit of steak, I know that's mine. I'm like, Unless you're a vegetarian, I'll see that pumpkin <laughs> or whatever it is. I don't want to offend anyone. You can offend people so easy these days. You know, that thing, whatever your thing is. A cup of air, I don't know. Is that what your prayer life's like? Because here's the thing. The early church, that's, that's what prayer was to them. And, and the challenge is, is that what our prayer life is like? Or do some of us in this room need to go back and drink from the well of the prayer of faith? Go back and drink from a place of faith. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean that you need to be on your knees in a 24-7 prayer time in a closet. You could flip that word. Pray without ceasing means cease not praying. Cease not praying. And why should we cease not praying? Because prayer moves mountains. Prayer makes a difference. And God, the one we're praying to, answers the prayers that we're praying. Amen?